cardiac arrhythmias are really divided into two areas, slow heartbeats and fast heartbeats. And as you know, the heartbeat starts in the sinus node, spreads through the atria, can only go down in the normal setting through the AV node and then down to the ventricles. So that slow heartbeats are due either to failure of SA impulse generation or AV or distal block. This was a tracing from a 61-year-old woman who presented with dizziness in association with this tracing. And this, of course, you'll, you'll note on the left the rapid heartbeat with the irregular baseline consistent with atrial fibrillation and a pause that follows. And this is the most common uh, cause of, uh, excuse me, this is a, a tachybrady syndrome, also called sick sinus syndrome or sinus node dysfunction. Uh, both atrial tachyarrhythmias and sinus pauses can be present. The key points to remember in this setting is that, first of all, history, ECG holder, or event recorders make the diagnosis. So the diagnosis is made by correlating symptoms with a spontaneous electrocardiographic tracing and that invasive studies are not required. Pacing is clearly indicated when the pauses are associated with symptoms, but in the absence of symptoms, patients can be followed without specific therapy. And this is another example of sinus node dysfunction, and you can see again in this Holter tracing sinus rhythm and followed by a long sinus pause and a similar tracing down below. One pearl. In this tracing, you'll notice what looks like a normal sinus rhythm at the end. And here there's a, a slower heart rhythm which suddenly picks up. And the answer to this tracing is in the T waves. The most common cause of pauses is non-conducted PACs. Now this is a little unfair because you don't see the whole tracing before it, but it looked just like this. And you can see that where the T waves are clearly distinct, the heart rate is slower because there's a PAC that's non-conducted. And then in the absence of the PACs, the normal sinus rhythm occurs. So when you see pauses, the other differential is non-conducted PACs. The other area of, of bradycardia, of course, is AV or distal block. And that comes in three flavors. First degree block is simply a PR interval that's greater than 200 milliseconds. Second degree block is divided into type 1 and type 2, also called Mobitz 1 and Mobitz 2. And in type 1, there is the Wenke-Bach with gradual PR prolongation. These don't require pacing. These in yellow quite often do, so it's an important distinction to make. In Mobitz 2, there's a precipitously dropped QRS without PR prolongation, and it's usually seen in the setting of a widened QRS. In high grade or advanced AV block, there are many more P waves than QRS complexes, but occasional P waves capture. And in third degree block, there is complete heart block or AV dissociation. And of course, the atrial rate is faster than ventricular rate. The reason I mention that is that AV dissociation is not the same thing as complete heart block. You can also have AV dissociation, for example, with ventricular tachycardia, where the ventricles are going faster than the atria and they're dissociated. So in complete heart block, the atria are going faster than the ventricles at a physiologic rate, and there's no association between the two. This is an example of Wenke-Bach, second degree type one, and you can see the P waves, if you march them out, are all coming at the same interval, which is important. So there are no PACs here. You see the typical group beating. There's a group of two, three, two, and so on. And then each progressive PR interval gets longer until the beat is dropped. And as you zoom in and as you can see, the PR is clearly getting longer. Because the PR is getting longer by a slightly smaller amount each time, in classic Wenke-Bach, the RR intervals actually get shorter. Now, in second degree type 2 AV block, you'll have an un, a precipitous dropped P wave. Also notice in this example, and, as, and this is most commonly seen in the setting of a widened QRS complex consistent with conduction system disease. And it's, it's very helpful to look at the company that any bradycardia keeps in deciding whether it's a physiologic uh, bradycardia or whether it's one that uh, requires intervention. In high-grade AV block, you can see there are many P waves, but this is not complete heart block because you can see, first of all, here's an escape interval, and here's a QRS that comes shorter than the escape interval so that it's clearly advanced by the P wave. 
And you'll also note that the PR intervals of the ones it captured are the same, so that these are conducting, these are all blocked, and then here's an escape. Here's another example of high-grade block. In this tracing over here, it looks like two to one, but you can see here there's a P wave and another one and another one in a series of them that aren't capturing. And lastly, in complete heart block, you can march the P waves through and you can see the atrial rate is greater than the ventricular rate. There's a wide QRS complex consistent with a high degree of con a conduction system disease and this is treated with a pacemaker. One more example of complete heart block. And here at first glance, you may say it's two to one block, but notice that the distance from the P to the QRS is changing until it actually goes into the QRS, and so they're almost isorhythmic, but they're clearly not associated so that this is complete heart block. So in summary, in assessing atrioventricular conduction, if significant block is present, first of all, there are more A's than V's. Again, you can have AV dissociation without heart block if you have an accelerated junctional rhythm idioventricular rhythms or ventricular tachycardia. And importantly, judge block by the company it keeps. An AV block with a wide QRS is usually in the Hisperkinji system, and that requires pacing therapy, whereas when you have a narrow QRS, more often than not, it's in the AV node, in which case autonomic tone, vagal tone, and whatnot can cause it. And now going to the tachycardias, and I'll start with supraventricular tachycardias. And this slide shows three tracings of intraatrial arrhythmias. And I just want to make a few points about distinguishing one from the other because the therapy is different. At the top is multifocal atrial tachycardia, and it's characterized by the following. Between the discrete P waves, and I think we would agree they're discrete, and here there's a series of them with one-to-one -one conduction, but between the discrete P waves there is an isoelectric interval so that there's not a constant undulation. And secondly, for multifocal atrial tachycardia, we have to have at least three different morphologies of the P waves, otherwise it would be an ectopic atrial tachycardia. And sometimes the distinction can be subtle, but the ones that you would see on boards, for example, would be fairly stereotypical. In contrast, in atrial flutter, you'll note that the morphology is identical and that it's repetitive because there's a fixed circuit. And that's important because the treatment um, can be by means of, of catheter therapy. In contrast, in atrial fibrillation, there's chaotic undulation with no real isoelectric interval. And as you look from these complexes to these over here, they're clearly different. Now, when you first see a patient with atrial fibrillation, it's important to keep in mind the common etiologies, both in terms of evaluation and in terms of management. Hypertension is one of the most common uh, concomitant etiologies, and it's important because the presence of hypertension with atrial fibrillation markedly increases the risk of stroke. So that patients with hypertension and atrial fibrillation should be anticoagulated, even young patients. Uh, it, atrial fibrillation may be a manifestation of cardiomyopathy, but at times atrial fibrillation can cause cardiomyopathy if there's an uncontrolled ventricular rate so that it is important to control the rate. Valvular heart disease can be associated with atrial fibrillation. As we already went over, sinus no dysfunction can. I'll, I'll go over Wolf, Parkinson, White in a moment. And then, of course, alcohol use is important as that's an easily, well, it's a reversible cause. And thyrotoxicosis is, of course, always important to keep in mind. Thyroid function should always be checked in a patient with atrial fibrillation. Management is divided into two broad groups. One is rate control with anticoagulation, uh, medically with calcium blockers, beta blockers, or digitalis. When those fail, AV node ablation is a choice. And in that approach, it's important to remember that the atrial fibrillation are rapidly wandering wavefronts in the atria. Their only way down is through the AV node. So if you uh, give medications to slow conduction down the node or ablate the node and insert a pacemaker, the atria are still fibrillating so that the risk of thromboembolism persists and anticoagulation is still required. <laughs>
On the other hand, with rhythm control, efforts are made to eliminate the uh, wandering atrial wave fronts themselves, most commonly with medications, but increasingly there's interest in pacing, surgical maze procedure, atrial defibrillators, focal ablation. Those are fairly newer treatments, and I, I won't really cover those, and nor will the boards. The, the key points, I would say, with regards to rate control for atrial fibrillation are, are, the, are the following. You're familiar with all these medications, but keep in mind beta blockers are particularly useful in hyperthyroidism because you're treating that condition as well. In post-operative patients, and in fact, patients who go for surgery, it's critical that beta blockers are maintained. Withdrawal increases the risk of uh, atrial fibrillation. In acute myocardial infarction, beta blockers in numerous studies and hundreds of thousands of patients have been shown to reduce mortality. And of course, more recently, in chronic congestive heart failure, beta blockers have also been shown to reduce mortality and hospitalizations. So that beta blockers should really be the first choice for rate control in many populations of patients. Additionally, since atrial fibrillation is more common in older patients, and older patients are more likely to have coronary disease and other conditions, it, it makes these excellent choices. Calcium channel blockers are also effective. They may be uh, better tolerated in younger patients. Important to remember that the dihydropyridine agents, nifedipine, amlodipine, and philodipine, do not slow avionodal conduction. They won't help in AFib. Don't use them uh, unless you're using them for some other indication, such as hypertension. Digoxin is less effective than beta and calcium blockers. It works mainly by enhancing vagal tone, and once a patient gets up to exercise, the, the sympathetic vagal balance changes and the heart rate will rapidly increase. So they may look like they have good rate control while lying in bed, but that will rapidly go away. In patients with heart failure, it can be effective in controlling symptoms. In conjunction with one of the other agents, it can be quite useful. Uh, with regards to the antiarrhythmic drugs, a few key points about these agents. Class 1A agents are infrequently used now as first choice agents in part because of the risk of proarrhythmia with QT interval prolongation. If it is your choice, keep in mind that they enhance AV conduction so that if you don't give something to slow the AV node first, such as a beta blocker, you may end up with a faster ventricular rate and more trouble. You may also organize the fibrillation to flutter and increase the risk of going one to one. The 1C agents, propafenone and flecainide, slow AV conduction. They're well tolerated in patients with a structurally normal heart, and they're often the first choice agents for patients with a normal heart. The main thing to monitor is the QRS duration. It shouldn't increase by more than 20% or so. Uh, and uh, some people suggest performing an exercise test because you do see the effects of these medications greater at higher heart rates. Class three agents such as sodalol and amiodarone. Uh, amiodarone is the agent of choice for patients who have depressed ventricular function or patients with previous myocardial infarction. In these populations, other agents have shown increased mortality, whereas amiodarone has been neutral or shown survival improvement. So for patients with significant structural heart disease, amiodarone is a good choice. Now the risk factors for thromboembolism are advanced age previous TIA, hypertension, in pooled analyses, diabetes, heart failure, as well as prosthetic heart valves and thyrotoxicosis. And there are echocardiographic findings as well. These are listed in the book and they're useful to know because they're important in deciding who's going to get anticoagulation. And it's simply this. In someone under 65 with no heart disease, and I added hypertension separately here to emphasize this, then no therapy or aspirin is a reasonable choice. In anyone over the age of 65, because age alone is a risk factor, warfarin for an INR of 2 to 3 should be instituted. If the age is between 60 to 65 and there are no risk factors, then it's a bit of a toss-up, although warfarin is slightly preferred. A few points about acute cardioversion for atrial fibrillation. If the duration of atrial fibrillation is beyond 48 hours, then anticoagulation is needed. That should be warfarin for three to four weeks with concomitant rate control and an INR in the range of two to three followed by cardioversion. This is certainly the most established method of cardioversion. 
Increasingly now, there are data emerging showing that TE may permit immediate cardioversion. The main role for TE really is a matter of convenience. If you perform a TEE and there's no thrombus, then you can cardiovert right away. However, it is important that the patient be anticoagulated, ideally just before the study, and that anticoagulated be maintained after cardioversion for at least three or four weeks. There have certainly been cases of a negative TEE, cardioversion, and subsequent stroke related to stunning, and it takes some time for atrial kick to resume following cardioversion. Atrial flutter traditionally was considered to be a low risk for thromboembolism, but increasingly studies are showing, in fact, that the best bet is to treat it like atrial fibrillation with regards to anticoagulation, both chronically as well as at the time of cardioversion. The risk of thromboembolism is probably in the order of 3% per year as opposed for an age-matched control of just over 1% and roughly 6% for patients with eight lone atrial fibrillation uh, in the older age group. Catheter ablation for atrial flutter is 90% effective, and in small studies, it's been more effective than medications. And rate and rhythm control medications are essentially the same as those used for atrial fibrillation. And that here again, you see the classic ECG, negative in lead two, positive in lead one, and the circuit, this is the right atrium when we've peeled away the lateral wall, and the circuit is just this one wavefront that's circulating around the valve. And because it has a fixed location, you can take a catheter and do a cautery line from the valve to the inferior vena cava and eliminate the arrhythmia. Now, PSVTs in patients with a normal ECG, that is a, a regular narrow complex tachycardia, most commonly is due to AV node reentry, although uh, approximately a third will be due to a concealed accessory pathway. A concealed accessory pathway is one which conducts in the retrograde direction from the ventricle to the atria, but not in the anterograde direction, and, and less commonly it will be due to an ectopic tachycardia. The key findings on the ECG are irregular narrow tachycardia. You may have heard talk of a long RP, short RP tachycardia. That likely won't be on boards, but um, so that you know with an AV NRT, because you're spinning around the AV node and going down to the ventricle and up to the atrium at about the same time, you can have the ventricles and the atria firing almost immediately or the atria firing right after the ventricles. And you'll often see, in fact, a pseudo R prime in V1. That's the atrial deflection. Because in an accessory pathway, you have to go down the node and up the pathway, and it takes more time, you'll see a retrograde P wave farther out in the ST segment. And these are both short RP tachycardias. With the ectopic tachycardia, you'll see the P wave in front of the QRS, and it's a long R to P tachycardia. The PSVT is characterized by abrupt onset and termination. It usually responds to vagal maneuvers. 90% or more will respond to adenosine, verapamil, or beta blockers acutely, chronically, to almost anything except for lidocaine, tokenide. Um, they're not life-threatening on otherwise normal hearts. They, they can be a little more serious, of course, if there's concomitant heart disease. And again, catheter ablation for patients who don't tolerate medications or don't want medications is 90 to 95% successful, and for most it's actually higher than that. Now, the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is characterized classically by symptomatic tachycardia. And on the ECG, you'll see a short PR interval, less than 120 milliseconds. It's important to know that patients with WPW may not always have the delta wave on their ECG. In WPW, the impulse begins in the sinus node, goes to the AV node, while at the same time it goes to an accessory pathway. And in essence, it's a race. And the part of the ventricle activated by this accessory pathway leads to the slurring of the QRS because this bit of myocardium is electrically activated through intraventricular conduction, which is slow as compared to the Hisperkinji system, which is the electrical highway for the heart. The classic finding, again, is the delta wave. And here again, you see going down the node and down the uh, accessory pathway at the same time, leading to the delta wave seen across many leads. And in the, these actual tracings from the patient, after ablation, you can see now the PR interval is longer and the delta wave is absent. There are three arrhythmias that can be seen in Parkinson White. The most common one seen around 70% of the time. Or excuse me, 70% of patients have arrhythmias and uh, about 80 to 90% will be orthodromic tachycardia where it goes 
down the node, up the pathway. Because you're going down the node, the ventricular complexes look normal. Because you're going up the pathway, if you look carefully, you can often actually see a little retrograde atrial activity in the ST segment. In contrast, in antidromic tachycardia, you're going down the pathway, up the node, and that gives you a wide complex tachycardia because the ventricles are being activated through normal myocardium, just as they are during ventricular tachycardia. And lastly, in atrial fibrillation, the ventricles are activated in part through the AV node and in part through the accessory pathway so that there's, they're competing and you'll see both wide complexes and narrow complexes. So you see an irregular QRS and you'll note the uh, variability and the degree of width because there's variable pre-excitation. This is the one time where you absolutely do not want to give adenosine. Here's an example in, in which somebody maybe didn't take that message to heart. And you can see here's uh, an irregular wide complex tachycardia. Six milligrams of adenosine were given and not much happened. So I guess the thought was maybe I needed to give more. And when that happened, you can see here it just accelerated tremendously because now all the activation is going down the pathway and there's no activation going down the node to compete with the pathway and block the pathway retrograde in what's called concealed conduction. This is, can lead to ventricular fibrillation. Here's a, just while we're on the topic of adenosine, here's one more slide, and this isn't one of the official questions, but here's a patient at a wide complex tachycardia, adenosine was given, and you can see this tremendously long pause, and the question is, what medication was the patient taking at the time? And this is something to keep in mind when you're getting ready to push the adenosine. The answer is dipyridamol, persantine. It blocks the metabolism of adenosine, so in patients on persantine, if you're going to use it, give less. So in, in summary for WPW, asymptomatic patients, there's no need for risk stratification unless their airline pilots are in a high-risk uh, occupation. And as you already heard from Dr. Barenbeck, there is no mercy for airline pilots. Um, symptomatic patients, however, should have an EP study both to stratify the risk by assessing how fast their pathways conduct in the anterograde uh, direction and to cure via uh, catheter ablation. And in terms of medical management for acute PSVT, vagal maneuvers, adenosine, verapamil, um, again, if you have a narrow complex regular tachycardia, you can give adenosine. It's when you have the atrial fibrillation that you cannot. To prevent PSVT, essentially anything that slows AV nodal conduction or atrial conduction, any antiarrhythmic drug will work except for lidocaine and tocanamide, those that only work in the ventricle. For atrial fibrillation, again, don't give digoxin, beta blockers, calcium blockers, adenosine. Use procainamide if that fails cardiovert. Um, th that would be the classic answer for boards. And uh, uh, lastly, ventricular arrhythmias. In patients with a structurally normal heart who have PVCs or non-sustained VT, the best course of action is reassurance. If the, they continue to have symptoms of palpitations, then you could consider beta blocker or calcium blocker if they're highly symptomatic. That's for the normal heart. Now, in contrast, patients with depressed ventricular function, particularly due to coronary artery disease, who have non-sustained VT are at high, could be at high risk even in the absence of symptoms. And there have been two studies, one actually back in 96 and now another one, and increasing data showing that in patients with coronary disease and a low EF and non-sustained VT, if an EP study is done and VT is induced, survival is significantly improved with an implantable defibrillator. So the patient who's had an MI uh, who doesn't feel their, their uh, non-sustained VT, even just three beats, should be risk stratified. Now what about wide complex tachycardias? First, the causes, there are six of them, and the size of the font kind of indicates the commonness. The most common cause is ventricular tachycardia, and if you just look at all wide complex tachycardias, 80% are VT. So if you're unsure, play the odds. The uh, other causes are SVT, either with pre-existing bundle branch block or in the setting of aberrancy. The SVT simply goes so fast that one of the bundles fatigue, giving you a bundle branch pattern, or in the antidromic that is going down the pathway up the node, Wolf-Parkinson-White that I already showed you. 
and then less commonly artifact from poor ECG connections or a paced rhythm. The patient history can be incredibly helpful. If the patient has an MI or heart disease, there's a 95% chance that the wide complex tachycardia is VT, even before you look at the tracing. The esophageal lead can be helpful. And just from a practical standpoint, if you connect a standard ECG machine and hook up the right arm and left arm to the transesophageal electrode, um, and then the rest of the ECG gets hooked up in the standard manner, and you get a recording, here's a wide complex tachycardia in lead two. Because the right arm and left arm are lead one, when you look at lead one, you get these nice crisp signals because the electrode is right behind the left atrium showing atrial activity. And in lead two, you see the ventricular activity and the atrial activity. And here you can see the ventricular rate is faster than the atrial rate, and there's AV dissociation, and this is VT. Adenosine is also very useful because it produces AV block and can reveal P waves in SVT or terminate some SVTs. And here's an example again of a wide complex tachycardia. A little irregularity here, but it looks like there's precordial concordance. And with adenosine, it slows down, and you can see that there's two to one conduction of this flutter. Previous ECGs are, as always, very helpful. If you see WPW, then it's likely a pre excited tachycardia. If there's a pre existing bundle branch block and it's similar to the wide QRS, then it's almost certainly SVT. It's very unlikely to get a VT that will mimic your SVT, whereas if it's a different bundle branch block, then it's most likely VT. The axis can also be helpful if you have a northwest axis that strongly favors VT. And here's a, a tracing from a patient with a wide complex tachycardia. And if you're negative in lead one and negative in lead F, that's a northwest axis. And uh, although infrequently seen, fusion or capture beats, which are con because of the underlying sinus rhythm, while the ventriculars are in tachycardia, will occasionally capture the ventricles. And this is a fusion beat where part of the QRS is, is activated by the atria and part by the ventricles. This one is actually more properly called a capture beat because this is a narrow complex likely entirely activated from above. Although not commonly seen when present, these are highly specific for ventricular tachycardia. And then lastly, the QRS width, if you have a right bundle and it's above 140 milliseconds or a left bundle above 160 milliseconds, that also favors VT, assuming the QRS is normal in sinus rhythm and there aren't any antirhythmic drugs, propafenone and flecainide and all those will certainly widen the QRS. And the morphology, if it's typical looking, favors aberrancy so that it would be triphasic in V1 in the typical left bundle. And as an example, here's a patient again with wide complex tachycardia. Note here that the R is taller than the R prime, left taller than right, which is atypical and favors VT. And uh, another tracing, a patient who walks into the emergency room uh, with this wide complex tachycardia, emphasizing the fact that patients can have a normal blood pressure with ventricular tachycardia, and you shouldn't assume, because you have a blood pressure, that it's not VT. And you can see the atypical bundle, and you see precordial concordance. And precordial concordance, again, is with all QRSs having a dominant deflection in the same direction. Let me just, as seen here, again, suggestive of VT these being all upright. So to summarize, in patients with a history of ischemic heart disease, AV dissociation, northwest axis, or precordial concordance, VT is favored. Additionally, if the QRS morphology uh, is different than a pre-existing bundle branch block, VT is favored. If the QRS is wide, more than 140 in right bundle, 160 in left bundle, VT is favored. And uh, a few additional comments. If VT occurs in the setting of acute MI in the first 24 hours, although there's an increase in hospital mortality and often the infarct-related artery is not patent, there's no increase in subsequent mortality and EP is not recommended. And this is particularly true for ventricular fibrillation that happens in the first 24 hours of an MI. In contrast, in other settings, if there's ventricular tachycardia with hypotension or syncope or out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, 
This is now best treated with an implantable defibrillator. Um, for acute VT, shock, for stable VT, lidocaine, amiodarone, procainamide, and bertillium. And last thoughts on boards. An optimist thinks this is the best possible world, and a pessimist fears that this is true. Question number one. A 78-year-old man describes having had several dizzy spells over the past few weeks. He also passed out once suddenly without warning. He has no previous cardiac history, takes no medications, and has been active walking several miles a day with no symptoms of breathlessness or chest pain. A Holter monitor was performed and a rhythm strip during an episode of dizziness is shown in the figure. The appropriate next step is number one, arrange for permanent pacemaker implantation. Number two, perform an electrophysiologic study. Number three, perform coronary angiography. Number four, perform a treadmill exercise test. Number five, none of the above. Correct answer is number one, arrange for permanent pacemaker. Question number two, a 24-year-old pregnant woman is admitted to the hospital for dehydration after protracted morning sickness. While on the monitor, the rhythm shown in the figure is noted. You are consulted. The next appropriate step would be number one, observation. Number two, immediate placement of a temporary permanent pacemaker. Number three, implantation of a permanent pacemaker. Number four, infusion of aminophilin. Number five, emergency echocardiography. Answer is number one, observation. Question number three, all of the following suggest the diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia, except for number one, P waves that march through the QRS complexes. Number two, right bundle branch block pattern with R prime taller than R. Number three, northwest axis, axis between 90, minus 90 degrees and minus 180 degrees. Number four, a different QRS morphology in patients with pre-existing bundle branch block. Number five, a history of structural heart disease. Correct answer is number two, right bundle branch block pattern with RSR prime pattern. In, in number one, P waves that march through the QRS complex are a sign of AV dissociation, and in the setting of a wide complex tachycardia, that's highly suggestive of the presence, uh, that's highly uh, consistent, a, a diagnostic of ventricular tachycardia. And number two, what I was getting at again was the morphology, uh, that in typical right bundle, right bundle branch block, the R prime or the second rabbit ear is taller. So if you see a taller second rabbit ear, that doesn't exclude VT, but it certainly doesn't favor it. And in fact, it tends to be a little more consistent with the barency. Question number four, a 56 year old man presents complaining of palpitations. An electrocardiogram is done and shown below. Which of the following statements is true? Number one, adenosine will terminate this rhythm. Number two, for successful cardioversion, 200 joules or more are required. Number three, radiofrequency ablation is more than 90% effective. Number four, propofenone has no effect on this rhythm. Number five, beta blockers are not effective for the control of the ventricular rate. Correct answer is number three, radiofrequency ablation is more than 90% effective. Question number five. A patient with palpitations for eight days presents to you for evaluation. An electrocardiogram is performed. Which of the following is not a risk factor in this patient for stroke? Number one, hypertension. Number two, previous cerebrovascular accident. Number three, an ejection fraction of 30%. Number four, female gender greater than 75 years of age. Number five, all are risk factors.
Expert answers number five, all are risk factors. Question number six, for the patient in question number five, which is not an appropriate course of action? Number one, check electrolytes and thyroid function. Number two, begin warfarin and plan on cardioversion in one month. Number three, begin beta blocker therapy. Number four, begin a heparin infusion and cardiovert immediately. Number five, all of the above are appropriate courses of action. Correct answer is number four, begin a heparin infusion and cardiovert immediately. Question number seven. A 64-year-old man with a history of myocardial infarction four years ago has been generally well. At 10 a.m. this morning, he developed palpitations while out hunting. He walked one mile back to his car and drove himself to the emergency room where an ECG was performed. He has had no chest pain or shortness of breath and feels mildly dizzy. His blood pressure is 95 over 70, the pulse rapid and regular. Which of the following is true? Number one, Canon A waves are not present on examination. Number two, adenosine is a treatment of choice. Number three, immediate cardioversion is required. Number four, lidocaine infusion is an appropriate therapy. Number five, ventricular tachycardia is not present since a pulse is palpable. Correct answer is number four, lidocaine infusion is an appropriate therapy. So I'll, I'll start with the rhythm, which is maybe somewhat hard to see from far away, but it is a wide, complex tachycardia, and that may be the, the first thing, or again, this example may be a little hard to appreciate. And if you look at V1, you can see a P wave here, and you'll notice that there are P waves that can be seen marching through, and you may notice that better in your book. So it is ventricular tachycardia, and because there is AV dissociation, Canon A waves would be present. Canon A waves are caused by the atria contracting against closed atrioventricular valves uh, when the atria and the ventricles are not coordinated. So, and it's one of the classic findings in ventricular tachycardia on physical exam. Adenosine is not the treatment of choice for ventricular tachycardia, and I think that, again, gets to the interpretation of this ECG. Um, Immediate cardioversion is not required because the patient is hemodynamically stable, is not having chest pain. Uh, a lidocaine infusion would be a very reasonable place to start. Uh, and again, to emphasize in number five, the presence of a pulse does not exclude ventricular tachycardia. Question number eight. A 28-year-old woman with no cardiac history is sitting in class when she feels sudden onset of palpitations and marked dizziness. This episode lasts for one hour. The symptoms subside spontaneously and she comes to you the next day for evaluation. Her electrocardiogram is shown below. The appropriate next step is number one, reassure the patient. Number two, perform an exercise treadmill test. Number three, perform a tilt table test. Number four, perform an electrophysiologic study. Number five, perform a coronary angiogram. Correct answer is number four, perform an electrophysiologic study. We'll go to question number nine. A 26-year-old medical student is observing the cesarean section when he begins to feel warm, clammy, nauseated, and then loses consciousness. He comes to promptly and feels embarrassed, weak, and washed out for the next several hours. There are no focal neurologic deficits. Physical examination and ECG are normal. The appropriate next step is number one, reassure the patient. Number two, perform a tilt table test. Number three, perform an electrophysiologic study. Number four, obtain a head CT and EEG. Number five, perform a treadmill exercise test. Correct answer is number one, reassure the patient. And question 10, a 45-year-old man develops a sudden onset of palpitations, chest heaviness, and difficulty breathing. He is brought to the emergency department where an ECG is obtained. All of the following are true, except number one, carotid sinus massage or valsalva maneuvers will frequently terminate their arrhythmia.